Well, if you've ever seen an episode of America's Funniest Home Videos, you've probably seen something like this where kids, even adults, if they go in for some sort of dental work or uh, to get their uh, wisdom teeth removed, then you've probably seen them coming out of sedation just like this. They're a little bit awkward. They aren't fully aware of everything that's going on and everything that they're doing. They say some of the funniest things in those moments, and yet social scientists and anthropologists in the recent years have observed that our fixation with technology and devices has lured us into some sort of cultural sedation of sorts. People feel numb, exhausted, lonely, not fully awake, not fully aware Uh, Kind of like we're all sedated. There's been enough research over the past several years that uh, that there is an impact of digital technology that it has on our souls. Uh, And today, we are going to continue in our series, Soul Detox, where we're looking at those things that are literally robbing us blind. And today, the majority of our impact, all of our discussion is going to be about this, and uh, different than your computer, different than your laptop, different than your tablets or your iPads, none of those things are around you and with you all day long, every day of the year. For our smartphones, there are times that we would rather be without an actual limb on our body than to be without our smartphones, right? If you're on your way to work, and you, for some reason, forgot your shoulder, you're like, I'm halfway there. We're just going to go without it today. But if you leave your phone on your way to work, you're like, I'm going to be late to work today. I don't know what to say. Uh, But hear me loud and clear. I said this last week in our series. I'm not suggesting or saying that these things are evil, okay, unless you have an Android, and that's between you and God, okay? You got to figure that out. We're not anti-technology. I'm not going to suggest today that you ditch your iPhone. Uh, I'm not going to suggest that you abstain from smartphones for the rest of your life or, uh, or abstain from doing your work or abandon your family and connection in that way. What I do want to suggest today is that we take an honest look at the impact that these devices are having on our hearts. That we take an honest evaluation at the impact that these devices are having on our relationships, in our marriage, in, in our parenting, with our kids, with our grandkids, with our, our souls. Could it be that we are trading the infinitely valuable for the trivial? There's a cost, make no mistake, there is a cost to our relationships, there's a cost to our spiritual formation, there is a cost to our mental health when it comes to our interaction with our digital devices. Uh, Why does any of this matter? Why should we care? Well, Solomon, uh, one of the, arguably one of the most wise people to ever be on earth, said this, keep your heart with all vigilance for from it flows the springs of life. The NIV, says, the NIV says it this way, above all else, guard your heart. Uh, above every single thing uh, that you could interact with, above every single thing that comes into your life, above all else, everything else, keep a close watch, guard your heart. Why is that? Because the reality is what you pay attention to, who you pay attention to, will determine what you worship. What or who you pay attention to will determine what or who you worship. And if we really slow down enough to look, we can see that there is this whole phenomenon that has sneaked up on us, snuck, sneaked, snuck, seeped into our lives in this last decade, uh, into the habits of our life, and dare I even say, the digital addictions to technology and our relationship with this powerful, luring smartphone. 
there was some research done by reviews.org that extensively looked at and evaluated cell phone usage by Americans. And this is what they found, that 89% of Americans check their phones within the first 10 minutes of waking up. 75% of Americans feel uneasy leaving their phone at home. 75% of us check their phones, our phones, within the first five minutes of a notification coming in. 75% of people use their phones on the toilets. You know who you are. May God convict your heart in this moment. 69% of people have texted someone who is in the same room as they're in. I get a little bit of discomfort laugh there, like, (laughs) that's funny, that's me. 60% of people sleep with their phone at night. 57% of people consider themselves addicted to their phones. 55% say that they've never gone longer than 24 hours without their cell phone. 47% of people say that they feel a sense of panic or anxiety when their cell phone battery goes below 20%. What creates anxiety in your life? The switch from black to red on the the battery. 27% or 46% of people use or look at their phone while on a date. 27% look at their phones while driving. Did you know that we check our phones an average of 144 times a day? There are newly defined digital injuries that are now part of the medical world. Did you know this? There's, There's now a digital injury called texting thumb Text neck is a real thing, apparently. Cell phone elbow is also a medically defined injury now. How is this even possible? Well, if you're anything like the 99% of smartphone users, when we wake up, our alarm clock goes off, we roll over, and with one eye open, see that there have been emails that have come in overnight and decide, now is the time I'm going to check my email. Of the world's 7.96 billion people on planet Earth, 6.92 billion people in the world have a smartphone. Now, I've been to some of the most remote villages on planet Earth where they don't even have electricity, they have no running water, they live in straw and mud huts, yet in those villages I've seen kids playing on smartphones. Smartphones don't just rob us of our time. We have literally lost our ability to pay attention. Did you know that now the average American attention span is eight seconds, which means at a rodeo, People can't even watch the bull riding to completion without losing our attention. By way of comparison, the goldfish has an attention span of nine seconds. We are losing to goldfish. Our attention leads to our adoration. And so as people who are practicing the way of Jesus... We want to be so unencumbered by the things that are designed to distract us. Catherine Price, who wrote the book, How to Break Up with Your Phone, said this, if you wanted to invent a device that could rewire our minds, if you wanted to create a society of people who were perpetually distracted, isolated, and overtired, If you wanted to weaken our memories and damage our capacity for focus and deep thought, if you wanted to reduce empathy, encourage self-absorption, and redraw the lines of social etiquette, you'd likely end up designing a smartphone. Steve Jobs and Bill Gates famously chose not to give their own kids access to a smart device. Major app developers, social media techs have chosen not to allow their kids to use their own apps and their own platforms. You see, the enemy wants us to live a distracted, sedated, numb life so that 
he can subversively and secretly steal our time and our attention. And here's how I know. I'm not just making this up into tricking you into giving up technology. It's right here in the pages of Scripture. We get a crystal clear picture of the playbook of our enemy in John chapter 10, verse 10, when Jesus says this, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus is saying this in this moment. The words of Jesus come couched in this moment when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I wanna guide you through life. My sheep know my voice. This he says to us, the enemy comes to steal and kill and destroy. Maybe you've come from a church tradition where they talked about the devil a lot or they talked about Satan a lot. Satan gets credit for a whole lot of things. Anything bad that happens in your life uh, goes in the devil's corner. You stub your toe, not today, Satan. You lose your wallet. You can't find a parking space. You can't get connected to Wi-Fi. The devil's in the router. It must be. But I think that today, actually, much of modern Christianity has swung to the other extreme, where we fail to remember that we actually have a real enemy with real forces, with real strategies to oppose us and attack us as God's people. We've got to remember that the Christian life is a journey, but the context for that journey is a battle. And the battle that we have with a very real enemy is a threefold strategy that our enemy has. It's right here in Scripture. You want to know the attacks, the way that our enemy is attacking us? It's right here. Number one, our enemy comes to steal. This word steal is the Greek word klepto. It literally means to steal. It's where we get the word kleptomaniac which describes anyone who has this involuntary urge to steal. This Greek word klepto means to steal or to filch. Anybody heard the word filch this week or in this life? No, filch means to secretly steal. It's this idea of cheating and misleading and disguising and concealing. This word was used Klepto was used in the Greco-Roman culture to describe stealing in such a strategic and clever way that the victim doesn't even know something has been stolen. I was with a missions team about 20 years ago in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and we flew in to Rio and got there early in the morning. We couldn't check into our hotel room yet, so we left all of our luggage in the lobby and decided to go across the street to Copacabana Beach. And when we were there, it's just this beautiful, beautiful area, and we're walking along the cobblestone sidewalks, and all of a sudden, these kids start coming up and playing some music, and to be quite honest, they're really talented. They're really good. They're they're cute kids. They're little Brazilian kids, and they play a couple of songs for us, and we take some pictures with them, and we're all happy to be in Brazil together when we realized these kids just robbed us blind. They pickpocketed all of the people. They stole all of the jewelry, all the necklaces, all the bracelets, all the watches that they could and went off running. They took everything from us, and this is how our enemy works. Our enemy wants to secretly steal our most precious resources, our time and our attention. It's why Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, Verse 11, as he's writing to this church in Ephesus, as he's laying this framework and foundation for what it looks like to follow Jesus, Paul says this, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Tristan Harris, a product designer at Google, framed for us what's at stake when he said that the tech industry is at an arms race for people's attention. As a general rule, with most technology, it's intentionally designed and engineered for distraction and addiction because that's where all the money's at. Economists have a name for this. They call this the attention economy. Seth Godin says, 
that your phone doesn't work for you, you work for your phone. But we want to believe the opposite, right? We want to believe that we're the customer and the phone is the product. But that's not the business model. We are the product. What is being sold is our attention. Neil Postman wrote a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death, and he predicted that depth and discipleship would give way to superficial, feel-good spirituality, which is why the psalmist wrote in Psalm 119, the longest of all of the psalms, the psalmist says this in Psalm 119, 37, turn my eyes from looking at worthless things. How timely. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. According to a survey in 2021, nearly half of the population of America spends at least six hours a day on their phones. We get a text message. We open said text message. Respond to this text message and then decide to check the weather and then pop over to Instagram and scroll a bit on the gram and then we get hit with a reel that is a suggested sponsored reel. And then before we know it, we're going down the rabbit hole of looking at different things. There's a science experiment with Mentos and Diet Coke. Then there's a quote by Dr. Phil and then there's the greatest pickleball shot you've ever seen in your life and then there's a quote from Elon Musk. Then there's an audition from America's Got Talent and on and on and on. And before you know it, you look up and 36 minutes have just evaporated, mindlessly, endlessly scrolling on our phones. I'm embarrassed to even even admit this, but I've been with my family at a a fun event together, uh, sharing a meal together, out at the beach together, And I'll pull up my phone to take a picture or record a video. And I'll notice that an email has come in. And and I've done this before where I've I've just intended to take a picture or record a video or uh, capture a family moment. And notice that I get an email and open it to find some scathing email from someone just brutally criticizing what we've done on a Sunday morning. And I couldn't look away. I read it. And the words cut deep. And as much as I wish I could stand up here and say to you today, as your pastor, you know what, in that moment, I just put my phone back in my pocket and never thought about it again. It's not what happened. Because I felt it. It hurt. And instead of being present in that moment with my wife and my kids, I was instead just rehearsing how am I going to respond to this email. The thief comes to secretly steal and kill. He comes to steal our time and our attention. But the second thing that Jesus tells us is not only is he here to steal things and rob you blind, the enemy is here to kill. It's this Greek word, thuo, which means to kill, to slay, to slaughter, to butcher, it's the same word that Peter uses when he's describing our enemy as a, as a prowling, secretive lion prowling around in our lives, ready to devour us. San Diego State University did a study on the significant rise in depression and suicide among teenagers between 13 and 18 years old. The study showed that teens who spent more time on their smartphones and on social media were more likely to report symptoms of depression, anxiety, and suicidality than teens who spent more time off screens doing face-to-face activities. Multiple studies in the United States, in Turkey, in China, in the United Kingdom have found that the more exposure an individual has to social media the more likely they are to experience mental health issues, anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts, social anxiety, low self-esteem, narcissism, insomnia, and decreased sleep. And please hear me say, I'm not trying to be overly dramatic today. I'm not trying to overstate something. 
But when someone feels suicidal, when someone wants to take their own precious life, Jesus reminds us and leans into the moment to say, hey, oh, by the way, the thief comes to steal and to kill. Is it possible that one of his most effective tools is right in front of us lighting up our faces, keeping us lonely, keeping us isolated, keeping us anxious in our own digital worlds. Since the creation of the smartphone 17 years ago, in the last 10 years, rates of teen depression and suicide have skyrocketed. Some experts even say that Gen Z is on the brink of a mental health crisis. The thief comes to secretly steal, kill, and number three, destroy. Uh, This is the Greek word apolumi. This is the word that means to destroy, to perish, to take away life. But there's also this underpinning within this word and this how this word is used that it's this idea that, yes, you're still existing. Yes, you're still breathing. But there's an absence of life. The lights are on, but nobody's home. Uh, to take it further, uh, you're the sharpest spoon in the drawer. There's this absence of flourishing. Jesus tells us that the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. But notice what Jesus says right after this. The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. I, Jesus, have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus said that I have come that you may have life, a life overflowing, a life of abundance, a life of flourishing and thriving. And yet, Research shows that the widespread impact of smartphones are destroying the next generation's ability to navigate the physical world. Research shows that smartphones are are impacting the development of social skills, they're impacting how we manage distress, how we manage conflict, how we manage anxiety. Smartphones are destroying healthy sexuality through constant and unlimited access to pornography. They target access to explicit content to children. Pornography destroys intimacy in marriage. And again, just as a reminder, we are not taking time and spending time in this soul detox series just to call something evil, just to tell you to go blow up your iPhone, just to tell you to go blow up your Android. I mean, some of those things self-destruct If you know what I mean, if you've seen the news, if you've got a Samsung, be careful. I'm just saying, I'm your pastor, I care about you. And we, as your pastors and staff, care so deeply about your soul that we want to identify, we want to raise awareness, and we want to eradicate the things that are robbing us blind. That's why Peter says to these Christians in the early church, uh, as he's laying the the bare essentials and the foundations of what it looks like to follow Jesus. Peter says this, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, our enemy, this thief that Jesus is talking about, your adversary, the devil, prowls, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him firm in your faith. Be alert, be sober-minded, be fully awake, paying attention and watching the enemy. Church, we've got to have a personal strategy in place because there's already an enemy in place. There's already an enemy prowling around, counting the ways, planning the ways to exploit your unique weakness, your own personal vulnerabilities, your own blind spots. And this enemy wants to take you out. So let me give you a threefold strategy. Are you ready? Write it down. Pull out your your smartphone and (laughs) jot it down if you'd like. Here's the strategy. Detach, discover, and delight. Detach from the thing that's robbing you blind. Discover the world around you and your family and begin to delight 
in what God has for you. In January and February of this year, I did a 45-day digital detox. Can I just tell you, I will never ask you to do something that I'm not willing to do or have already done in my own life. But maybe you grew up in a family, maybe you grew up with a teacher or maybe even a pastor, a really poor leader who's like, do as I say, not as I do. We're not gonna do any of that around here. Okay, so I did a digital detox for 45 days in the month of January and February. And I did this, and, and I just want to tell you about it as I invite you into this. For 45 days, I shut off all of my notifications, and they all came in at one time every day. And they would come in in this lump sum summary of all of the notifications for the entire day. In those 45 days, I disengaged from social media. I took my phone out of the bedroom and charged it in a completely separate room. When I got home from work, I would come home, hug my wife, kiss my wife, hug my kids, kiss my kids, and then walk upstairs and leave my phone for the rest of the day overnight and I wouldn't pick up my phone again until I left for work the next morning. Can I tell you what I missed? In this whole digital detox, here's what I missed. Nothing. And a whole lot of it. I missed absolutely nothing. And what I learned was exponentially large. What I learned was I was listening more. I learned that I was saying, huh? A whole lot less. I learned that I missed a whole lot in life. I laughed more. I cried more. I had more significant conversations with my wife and my kids. I learned an important lesson that I am so much less important than I'd like to think that I am. We went on more walks. I actually tasted flavors in foods that I didn't know existed. I was more creative. Uh, When we went out, I noticed the beauty and incredible splendor of nature all around us. Did you know there's a reason people love to live in Southern California, and it is not the sunshine tax? I felt the feeling of cool grass under my feet. I noticed the ways that my daughter's eyes crunch when she smiles and the exact specific angle that she tilts her head when she laughs. I noticed the way that my son's eyebrows make a perfect half moon shape when his attention is captured. I heard birds chirp, but not just birds, specific birds making specific sounds. I actually counted the number of times that our mini golden doodle did the potty dance and how many times she went back and forth and back and forth and confirmed she's crazy. Do you know what it felt like? It felt like 1998. It felt great. And I want to, in the most persuasive way that I can, not in a way to Jesus juke you, but to actually have you consider what this device is doing to your soul. I'm not asking you to become Amish. I'm not asking you to go back in the good old days. I'm not asking you to ditch all of your digital technology. I totally understand that we need to use digital technology in our modern world, but I'm asking you, I am begging you to think about what we're thinking about to pause long enough to consider what goes through our minds and what comes into our hearts as we welcome them into our homes. Do an audit of your own use of digital technology. We, we manage danger everywhere else. Why would we not want to manage this? Let me give you some questions to ask. Maybe you want to jot it down. Maybe you want to put it in your smartphone. But some questions to ask. What's a healthy phone routine for me? Where will I charge and keep my phone? 
when will I allow myself to look at my phone in the morning? When will I, when will I put it away for the night? What apps are the most unhealthy apps for me? How am I gonna interact with my phone when I'm with people that I love? How will I interact with my phone when I'm watching TV, when I'm eating a meal, when I'm driving down the road, when I'm at a meeting? Should there be device-free zones in our home? When do we give our kids phones? Uh, spoiler alert, we have not given our kids a phone, not a flip phone, not a smartphone, and I know that's weird, but we're just okay being weird. In fact, we, we have a family ethic. We're, we're just okay as a family to not be like every other family. And maybe you've already given your kids phones, and, and maybe you're wondering, how do we rein it back in now? Can I just tell you, it's not gonna be easy. It's not easy. But we all want the best for our kids, don't we? We're all trying to work out in our world how to protect our kids and guide them in this new world. And so maybe, maybe today you would go home and say, hey, we've been talking about this in church. We've been talking about some things that are, that are not really helping us. And so how can we navigate this as a family? I'm wondering what's best for you. Here's what I know. This is not an individual problem. It is a widespread societal problem. Our unhealthy relationship with these devices are wreaking havoc in our personal, relational, and spiritual lives. And we have to work out a new way forward. I can tell you this. We got here. We got to where we're at in community. We're going to get out of where we're at in the context of community. Listen, if, you're, if your interest is peaked and you're like, maybe I need to take a digital fast, can I encourage you to do that within the context of community? You need a small group around you so that you can say, how's this working out for you? So that they can say, are you really working this out in your own life? Friends, we got to do this in the context of community because we have to go forward. We can't keep going backwards. We've got to move forward toward this better life, this abundant life that Jesus is inviting us to. Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful for your faithfulness. We're grateful that you're not a God who just wants to take from us, but you're a God who offers something even better to us. And so God, today, would you help us as we care for our souls, as we begin to think about the things that we think about, as we begin to prioritize what really matters in our life, God, would you just help us to let go of what's so trivial? God, may we pick up what's infinitely valuable. God, give us ears to hear and eyes to see the beauty that you've blessed us with all around us. The families, the children, the, the spouse that you've given us. God, would you reframe and reshape the attention of our heart so that our enemy isn't robbing us blind. God, would you in a way that only you can, give us the detox that our soul desperately needs. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.